Today we're going to conclude our high-level work with uh, ODE 45, the differential equation solver. Next week we're going to look at how these solvers work under the hood. This is just to give you context of how they're typically used effectively as a simulator. They're, they're ODE 45 is a line of code that will simulate some system for you so long as that system can be written out as a system of first order differential equations. Last class, what we started looking at was we started looking at a pendulum. We said if we had a pendulum with a mass on the end here, and if we defined our x and y as the usual axes things here, then when this pendulum swings, there are very clear forces at work here. There's gravity, and there's the force of the rod that holds the uh, mass from hitting the ground. And those forces are predictable. If I know where I stand in terms of x and y, and we throw in a little bit of knowledge about uh, our velocities as well, so if we know those four ingredients, then we can actually fill in this right-hand side, which is the sum of the forces. Oh, wait, sum of the forces divided by mass, because, wait, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. This is what happens under the hood when you're looking at, you know, people predicting space launches and trying to simulate space launches under the hood. So let's try to build our own simulator for this particular system. To do that, we have to use four variables because we need a first order system. And if I go back a second, these guys are, of course, second order derivatives. They're second derivatives. So we do this invention of new variables that I introduced or reminded you of last class which is we're going to invent four variables, and two of them are going to be really, really boring. W1 is going to be the same thing as x. W3 is going to be exactly the same thing as y. So in some sense, they're not really invented at all. They're just renamed. What is different is that we're going to invent an intermediary variable here, W2, which is equal to the x velocity, or x prime. And when we do that, it lets us write out four equations, which have one derivative each in them, uh, that we can put into MATLAB. And again, this basic idea of having x and y being two coordinates and the acceleration in each of them being the net force divided by m, that's surprisingly universal for force-based uh, simulations. So now what we're going to do is move this into MATLAB. So where we're going to start is our pendulum xy differential equation. So this is modeling it differently than we did last class. And I think I have two of them open for some reason. There we go. So there's some reminders here about what these variables are and so on. But the idea is, if someone tells us what w is, and remember what we just said a second ago, w is the position velocity in x, position velocity in y. And the slide before that, we said, if I know my position and velocity in x and my position and velocity in y, I know everything I need to know to calculate their derivatives, which is all we need for the simulation. So by handing w in, we're handing all these four pieces of information. We just have to interpret it correctly as we write the code. And honestly, this I would write up like the math. So here, we want to get the net force. <coughs> Goal is to get f net as a vector. And f net is going to be a combination of two things. It's going to have a gravity force, which is 0 minus m times g. So the x component is 0. The y component is always downwards, negative mg. And then we have the more complicated one. We know we need the rod force at the end of the day. And I'll bring this up in a second. But it was mass times, I'm going to call it speed squared over L. And then it had a minus uh, the dot product of a U with, oh, FG. FG. All right. Take a look at that piece of code. I'm going to bring back the math that was on the page a second ago, which is exactly that. <laughs> so this part here was the force that we calculated for the rod. It has to exert enough force so that we get centripetal acceleration that matches our speed. And it also has to cancel out the gravity component so that the net force is just the centripetal acceleration when we cancel out those various pieces. This is the force for the rod. 
I just created some, or I just made some new names like M. Well, M's already defined, so that's good. Speed is not defined, but we can calculate what the speed is. How can I find out given the input? So remember, this is a function that tells me if someone tells me where I am and how fast I'm going in x and y, can I figure out my current speed? Look at that first line. What's in w, and how would I work from that to get the actual speed, the magnitude of the velocity? So let's get a velocity vector. And you're right, it's x prime and y prime would be the components of it. But of course, we don't have those, right? So what is the other name for x prime? w2, exactly. Let's go right back to here. Hey, x prime is w2. y prime is w4. So when we have this in MATLAB, it's w bracket 2, because that's the second element of w, and w bracket 4. That's how we'd write that in the MATLAB code. Perfect. And now, bringing back a feature that we've seen before, uh, the speed, you can do it the long way with square root, blah, 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 blah. But there's actually a function in MATLAB that calculates the <coughs> magnitude of the velocity vector, or of any vector. And it's called norm. So, complete. So what we have here is now we've built the velocity vector from the inputs. This is the key thing. Someone gave us w, that's all we know. But from there, we could pick out the two x and y velocities and make a vector out of that. So it's the velocity vector in x and y, two elements. And then we could say, well, how big is that vector? What's the magnitude of it? And the norm function in MATLAB, we've seen that before, does that calculation. Or again, if it, that didn't occur to you, you could also say speed equals the square root of v1 and v1 squared plus v2 squared. That, does exa that is exactly the same code, in fact. So whichever one makes more sense. And then we go down the list. Our L, which is the length of the rod, notice that wasn't given right now. All we know is our position and our velocities. However, we should be able to figure out the length of the rod from those ingredients. If I go back to the picture here for a second, how can I figure out, knowing where I am, what the length of the rod is supposed to be? Y. X and Y, right. We know where we are, x and y. We know the other end of the rods is 0, 0. So in fact, very much like the velocity vector, we can figure out the length of that vector from the origin to x, y. So our L would be, let's actually call this our position. Our position is actually w1, the x coordinate, and w3 as a partner. And so our L is the norm of the position vector. So it's the distance from 0, 0 to our current x, y. All right. So this is all stuff you can figure out. It just comes from the pictures. Just have to connect the dots. In this case, literally from 0, 0 to x, y. Oh, yeah, I'm missing something, too, actually. I just realized. Right. This whole thing, we had a unit vector involved here. There's a unit vector that points back up the direction of the rod. That was handy because it said that's the direction that this force is going to be applied in. And then we said, OK, if I take that direction and multiply it by the magnitude, this is a scalar, that's a scalar. We have two scalars that cancel each other out a bit. Uh, then we're going to get the actual direction force vector, which is obviously different than the magnitude. Uh, we'll get the force vector there. So there's one ingredient missing here, which is that f rod should be u times all of this. Everything inside the brackets is a scalar, but u should be a vector. Of course, then we better build the u vector. In fact, my position vector that we just created is a handy starting point. The position vector is going to point from the origin to here. u is going to point in the opposite direction. So it'll be the negative of the position vector. So it's negative of the position vector. But I want to make it length 1 so that when we project, we get things uh, scaled the right way. So we can just divide that by the norm of the position vector. So u is now a unit vector pointing up back towards the origin. I'm going to pause there. That's the most odd thing in terms of the calculation side. Show of hands for that seems to be OK. We're OK with the kind of projection. Fantastic. Everything else here is exactly what we talked about in the math. 0 oh, omg uh, times u times these guys here. And once we've got our vector, so f rod is a two element vector, so f net would be fg plus the rod force. It's a vector now, too. And now we go and we build our output. So 
having the net force now compute uh, the, we are computing what? All oh, right, the rate of change, change of each w. dw dt is going to be a four element vector. So I, I'll create a vector here that's got four rows, one column. Four element column vector. And then we're going to fill them in one by one. And again, we're just going to go back to what we had on paper. We're not doing anything here. We're simply writing out in MATLAB what's on paper. Hey, what's the derivative of w1 going to equal? What's the rate of change of w1? Well, w1 is the x speed. We already have a name for the x speed. It's w2. So if I wanted to know how fast x1 was changing, I would use w2. If I wanted to know how fast w2 was changing, well, that's how fast the velocity is changing, which is my acceleration. So it's going to be 1 over m times the net force x component. So 1 over m times the net force, and the x component is the first part of that vector. And if we start going down this, we get exactly the same thing for the y's, and except we use the y component of the net force for the y acceleration. So if you think of these things as two element vectors, x, y, x, y, and w is the four element vector, which is x position, x velocity, there's a little bit of bookkeeping, but it's not horrible. And that's it. This function, if we tell it where we are right now, it will calculate a vector called dw dt, which is the rate of change of all those vectors, of all those values. And that's exactly what the simulator needs to run. That's what OD45, the differential equation solver, needs.